the first GX was called GX470 because it had a 4.7 liter engine. The second gen was GX460 because it had a 4.6 liter engine. Now we got the latest generation, GX550, but it only has a 3.4 liter engine. Then why was it named 550? To my surprise, no one really knew. So I asked the chief engineer himself. So what does the 550 stands for? Because it, uh, it can output uh, the appropriate amount of power and torque uh, that a typical 5.5 liter V and A uh -huh. would output. Hmm, did you guess that? Well, it may sound impressive, most Toyota fans will probably take it a wrong way. Aren't we overstressing a smaller engine? So in this video, we will dive deep into Toyota's new twin turbo V6, V35A FTS. How does it achieve crazy high torque with such a small package? And more importantly, how does it maintain Toyota reliability? Or does it? And make sure you stick to the end where I interviewed a Lexus technician who actually had to replace some of these engines. All right, let's get started. The V35A FTS was first introduced in the 2018 Lexus LS. It then made its way to the Land Cruiser 300 series, Tundra, Sequoia, and the LX600. The GX550 has the lowest peak power. I thought it was just different tuning. But according to Koji, the chief engineer, it was actually because we're running smaller turbochargers on the GX. Uh, and this time, the, the LX stands as a flagship. And the GX represents our, our true off-roader within the Lexus line, the hardcore one. But our maximum torque is still 650 Newton. Yes. And so this is the same as the LX, yes. so there's no... Yeah. 479 pound-feet of torque was a 46% increase over the V8 in the GX460. But to really put it into context, 479 is more torque than the G-Wagon's 4-liter bi-turbo V8, Defender's 5-liter supercharged V8, and Jeep Wrangler 392's 6.4-liter Hemi V8. So it is just crazy. A 3.4-liter V6 from Toyota can output so much torque. So much torque. The chassis twisted coming off the line. Most Toyota fans prefer old-school, naturally aspirated engine. Reliability is one, which we'll get to later, but a practical reason is good, predictable, low-end torque. There is no turbo to spool up, so there is no lag. However, not only does this twin-turbo V6 have higher peak torque, it also achieved that at lower RPM. And so for us, so that our, our users, GX owners, can enjoy off-roading to, the, to you know, the maximum potential, we really focus on low-end uh, response and drivability. But how? If we compare the spec sheets of the old and new GX, the displacement per cylinder was nearly identical. But one huge difference was the bore and stroke. The old engine has big bore, short stroke, which is over square, while the new one has small bore, long stroke, so it is under square. Bore versus stroke has always been a hot topic among car enthusiasts. The general wisdom is that an over square engine can achieve higher peak power, while an under square engine has better low end torque. This narrative perfectly aligns with the V35A, which is very undersquare. I thought this must be it. I cracked the code. So I brought this up during our interview and expect to impress the chief engineer. But... So that wasn't the only uh, contributing factor. Oh, okay. I don't know. 
First, uh, you know, the, the bank angle between the V8 and V6s uh, are different, so we need to find the, the, the most optimum uh, bank angle. And of course, we're comparing a NA engine with a V6 twin turbo mm -hmm. engine, so that's different. Okay. So we look at it as a total engine, and then we try to find the best bore stroke for that particular engine oh, okay. unit, that power unit. So the bore stroke is is not really the, the main thing. Bore stroke is not the main thing. No, not the main thing. Ah. So it, it is one factor within a, a multitude of factors that you know, contribute to that. Okay. I really love this part of our conversation because my line of thought probably represent many car enthusiasts. We tend to latch on to one idea and oversimplify. But as Koji pointed out, bore and stroke was only one part of a much bigger picture. So yeah, I didn't crack the code, but they did say... Good question, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you thank you. Very good question. Thank you, yes. By the way, you're probably impressed by how technical our translator was. Well, he is no regular translator. This is Toshi Hayama. He was the former host of many automotive shows, and he built a lot of cars. And in fact, he was the technical advisor for Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift. Wow, you can read the brochure. The Lexus GX was my first ever vehicle press event. If you want to see me interview more people like Koji and Toshi, you can help. Simply watch this video to the very end and hit the like button. When car makers see more people are enjoying my content, they will invite me to more events. And I appreciate your support. All right, let's talk reliability. One key attraction of old school Toyotas was their engine. They typically produce very modest output relative to their displacement. In other words, modest specific power and specific torque. This equals less wear and tear, and therefore reliability. But now, we seem to be doing the direct opposite. So I voiced this concern to the chief engineer. So uh, it should not change because we have developed these new engines with the same standards of, of QDR and durability mm -hmm. uh, to those standards that we already set. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is good to know, but of course they're going to say that. The thing is, we lost 25% of engine displacement, but we are pushing 16% more power and 46% more torque. How could this possibly not equal more wear and tear? So I pry on them a little harder. And then the, you make the engine, the smaller engine, work harder is, right. is, the, is the, the overall, the instant, yeah. Correct. So our combustion efficiency has also increased as well. So up until now, we, were, we had to combust more, but now we're able to create more power with less combustion, which causes less uh, you know, stress and, and fatigue. Oh, as well. wow, that's very interesting. Ah, okay. So combustion efficiency is what I was missing. But how does that work? We so, do have a limited amount of time, so only until uh, 1.30. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Unfortunately, I had to wrap up our interview. But fortunately, I found a paper on Society of Automotive Engineers specifically about the development of V35A FTS. Keep in mind, this was not marketing material. I actually had to pay $37 just to gain access, because this was a proper scientific paper. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. In this SAE publication, I found exactly where we left off, and here is what I learned. The ultimate goal of all internal combustion engines is higher thermal efficiency, which means harvesting more mechanical work out of the same amount of fuel. However, there is one inherent trade-off between thermal efficiency and specific power, or horsepower per liter of displacement. This plot from the paper shows a bunch of conventional engines across manufacturers. 
and we can clearly see an inverse relationship. So if we want to produce more power with less displacement, we are increasing the specific power. With conventional technology, this engine tends to have worse thermal efficiency. So we need to combust a lot more fuel and most of that simply becomes heat. All that leads to more wear and tear. So our concern about high output out of a small engine does have scientific roots. If we assume technology remains the same. But in this case, it is not the same. As part of the dynamic force engine family, Toyota overcame that trade-off using what they called high-speed combustion, which is essentially combustion efficiency Koji mentioned. With that, this twin-turbo V6 achieves high thermal efficiency and high specific power at the same time. Now we're able to create more power with less combustion, which causes less uh, you know, stress and, and fatigue. Oh. Which is what... Therefore, it is not overstressed in the same way a conventional engine would. So how exactly do we get high-speed combustion? If you search online, you find these cool animation showing optimized intake port angle and geometry to promote tumble flow. But the issue is, these marketing materials kind of make you think that is all there is to it. But in this SAE paper, the intake port was not really a standalone thing. Instead, there are many other changes to the engine fundamentals. Those need to take place first. In fact, even high-speed combustion is just a primary concept. There are many other things mentioned in this paper I didn't even touch on. In other words, if you simply machine those intake port geometry onto the old V8, that alone will not give you high-speed combustion. The intake port was only one part of a much bigger picture. Hmm, sounds familiar? That was just like my bore and stroke discussion with the chief engineer. It is one factor within a multitude of factors that you know, contribute to that. Okay. The overarching theme here is, things are not that simple, but most of us don't know what we don't know. So before you post emotional comments about the new engines, I encourage you to first spend $37, read the paper, and equip yourself with more knowledge. I will link it in the video description. Okay, so far, Everything sounds great, but all those were research and development. What about in real life? And this is where things got interesting. This is my friend Chris. He wields a Land Cruiser 200 series. And he has been a Lexus technician for 20 years. A few months ago, he sent me this message. A LX600 which has the same V35A, came in for main bearing issue. The main bearings are what holds the crankshaft in place. When the main bearings wear out prematurely, the crankshaft, which holds all the torque, will start racketing violently. Okay. There are also reports of the same issue on the third gen Tundra. So I interviewed Chris to gain more insight. So I think we're suffering from the same things. Um, we've seen at least one with a main bearing issue mm -hmm. on the LX600 mm -hmm. and on the LS460s, no, the LS600s. We've also seen an issue with the main bearing. What's surprising to me was, all the way back in 2018, when they first launched the LS500, Chris already worked on a main bearing issue. Yeah, that probably had around 20,000 miles on it. Okay. And uh, yeah. Exact same bearing. Exact same bearing. Uh -huh. But that, that um, block that we replaced, that car is still in service to this day. And we still service that thing regularly, so. Oh, that's a local yeah. guy for you, okay. Yeah, fingers crossed that it's still good. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a big, it's a big project once yeah. you get that thing all torn apart and things like that. Hmm. The vehicle that had the bearing issue, were they like hard drivers or? 
something I need? You know what? I don't know. Okay. I mean, the car had very few miles. The car had so few miles, it was almost like a, it's just still like a brand new car mm. at that point. But how the previ- how the customer drove it, yeah. it's unbeknownst to us. Okay. Because I, I see some internet uh, comments as the fairing wears out because, oh, because you're getting so much power out of the smaller engine. You wouldn't have that problem with a V8. Uh, I mean, that's, that's such a loaded comment, right? Because mm-hmm. <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah, so, so the bearing is, is seeing more load. It is. It's seeing more torque, but... Right. But, I mean, it goes into... You can get so technical about it. Like, okay, how, how big is the bearing surface compared to the outgoing? Right, right. How much force is it seeing at what RPM and things correct, like that? Correct, correct. So it's not a blank state. We can just say... Yeah. This like, like, caused the this, bearing yeah, wear out. Yeah, there's, yeah. It's, not, it's not really black yeah. and white. Right, because from, from the evidence I can find, the bearing is, like, beefed up in some way. Like when is the material change? It is. Here, we were looking at Chris' technical training document for both the V8 and the V6. To my surprise, the old V8 actually used resin bearing liners. Basically, we had steel sliding on plastic. But in the new engine, all bearing liners were changed to metal. And Toyota was very clear about the intention. Yeah, it does says a metal overlay is used on the inside surface of the connecting rod bearing the same as the crank bearing, everything is metal. Yeah, to support high load and high speed driving. Right. That occurs due to the use of a turbocharger. So they, they're actively they're si- yeah, they are, doing they, it they for... They want you to know. In addition to the liner, the main bearing caps were also updated. Uh, it says cast iron crank caps embedded in the AL casting. So is the crank caps what holds the main bearing? Is that a crank cap? Uh, yes. In the old V8, each main bearing has a separate crank cap. It is made from cast aluminum and is held in with six bolts, which is called six bolt main. In comparison, the new engine combines all four crank caps into one large structure. Toyota calls it a ladder frame. The individual crank caps are now made from cast iron, and they are embedded inside this ladder frame. The design intent was to increase rigidity and robustness. So in theory, the new main bearings are supposed to be better, but somehow we seem to have more failures on this specific part. And, and there's no official explanation on why the bearing is like that? No. Okay. No, we just replaced the long block and we, well, we were just replaced the short block and hope that nothing else got damaged and mm. go from there. Okay. It's a case by case scenario. It's not like, a, okay, this is an issue. This is what we're going to do to fix it. Mm. Granted, we don't have the full statistics on this bearing issue. Maybe it was overblown a bit. But here's an anecdotal perspective for you. Chris had worked at Lexus for 20 years. Out of all the vehicles that came into his dealership, he had only seen two main bearing issues. And both were V35A FTS. And right before I was about to post the first version of this video, I got another message from Chris. He just got his third main bearing failure. As of right now, April 2024, this is still a developing story. But does this mean we should just forget about all the good things we learned earlier? Of course not. Just like the boring stroke discussion and high-speed combustion, the bearing failure is probably not that simple. There are many mechanisms we simply don't know. I sure hope Toyota could give us some official explanation. That will make me feel a lot better. If I learn anything new, I will for sure keep you guys posted. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next one.